Well, we arrived in Amaravati quite late. It was already dark, um, too dark to do any filming outside around the grounds. I mean, the whole trip has been uh, quite rushed. There's a lot to do in a very short space of time. And Bill's been wonderful. He's just been driving me everywhere. And uh, also, both my debit cards wouldn't function in the UK or in Iceland, and so I was completely stuck and had to rely on him for everything. It's the way it is in the world, really. It's, uh, in order to do one thing, you need two things. Just to get by, you need a mobile phone and a debit card and a bank account and an address. And I think it must be very, very difficult uh, for people who have lost their jobs, who are homeless. The modern world is very complicated. Things at this place seem to be quite simple, really. It certainly seems to be a lot easier uh, to remain a monastic in a place like this, in this kind of community. There is infrastructure and support. And it doesn't feel like living in the mundane world in some ways. You've got a community and uh, they look out for each other. I think it's incredibly important. We need to support each other. In the end, we leave this world on our own. Uh, but we need to work together. That's what these monastic communities are about. They're places that are supportive for practice. So when we came in, then I uh, spent some time talking to some of the monks here, and also to a senior monk, an Ajin. He's from Russia, I don't know his name. And I asked him a little bit about his experiences. And you know, they weren't too dissimilar to the experiences that we, we hear about in the Tibetan tradition. And many people uh, come to the spiritual path they come initially seeking peace and tranquility or just to get a break from the hectic and relentless pace of modern life. And so with this Ajin, this uh, senior uh, monk, or you could say Lama here, had said is that, well, they don't discriminate against people or hold it against them for having this motivation being motivated uh, to find peace in this life. And what he said is, once they have made a connection, and once they can see how effective the Buddha Dharma is, then they can be encouraged to take their studies further. And it's the same for us. Although we may not have the greatest motivation, when we start out on our practice, then once we see the benefits of the Dharma, it's possible for our motivation to evolve. And this is the same for all these three, view, meditation, and conduct. They naturally have to evolve. It's not something that you can just completely fake. And although initially we may only be motivated to find peace and tranquility for ourselves, uh, then eventually our motivation will evolve. It will evolve along with our view and our conduct. So what is my initial or general impression of this community of Amravati in Hemel Hempstead, north of London? Well, everybody I've met has been very kind of open and kind, very helpful. And also there's a sense of peace and tranquility in this place. I met one monk, asked him how long he'd been here, and he said that he wasn't really from this place. He'd been spending most of his time, or the last three years or so, 
uh, Chithurst, which is another branch of this uh, Thai force tradition from the teacher Ajin Chan. And initially, what he did was that he was working and he gave up his job and thought he would spend some time in the monastery. And then COVID hit. And so he got locked in. And then while he was staying there, locked in at the monastery in Chithurst, then he started to think that this wasn't a bad way to live. It was actually quite a pleasant way to live. And so he took some Upasaka vows. And then after a little while longer, the Samanera or the Novus vows. And so in that way, his kind of way of approaching or dealing with the Dharma evolved naturally over time. And he was very respectful, very kind and respectful and very peaceful individual. And it was the same for the lay people who were staying here. As I said, there's a natural sense of tranquility about the place. And this is a reflection of the power or the effect of the Dharma. The Dharma is the methods that bring tranquility. They tame our suffering in samsara. What does it tame? It tames our negative emotions and negative tendencies, our tendencies to grasp at that which we desire, and also to push away or to become angry when we encounter that which we do not desire, that which we dislike. And this is what keeps us going around in circles in samsara. It's not these outer things. It's our way of relating to our experiences. It's our desire and anger, ignorance, jealousy and pride, that sort of thing. But we have a hard time accepting this fact. Because as soon as anything goes wrong, uh, then we're immediately trying to point the finger outwards to find somebody to blame, the government, our enemies. But what the Buddha taught was that this is not the cause of our suffering. The cause of our suffering is our mind poisons. In principle among these, is clinging to the notion of a self. The senior monk, the Ajahn, then he said, in general, he teaches Westerners uh, meditation. Because they have this feeling like they want to experience some well-being and bliss. And then once they have uh, experienced or had a taste of this kind of well-being that comes from the practice of meditation, and then he'll slip in a few words about uh, the Four Noble Truths, etc. He told quite a funny story. He said that he was doing his usual meditation teaching, and then after a while he would put in a few words uh, from Buddhist philosophy, uh, like the Four Noble Truths. And then this one woman said, listen, I don't want to hear your talk about the Four Noble Truths, etc. I came here just to relax. <laughs> so by that you can see that she was having a hard time in her worldly life and she found the monastery to be a kind of escape. And really that's the kind of idea we get when we think about retreat. Most people think when we go into retreat we're trying to escape our worldly lives and kind of chill out or relax a bit. But really, retreat is itself quite a difficult thing to do. Many people find it challenging. It's almost as if our retreat practices cause us even more trouble than samsara. Here, in the Theravadin tradition, they also do retreats. But I think it's a little bit different from the Tibetan uh, Vajrayana retreats. It's primarily focused around chanting and praying and also doing uh, shamatha meditation or calm abiding meditation. They develop a lot of samadhi. That's where the senses are drawn inwards and the mind is brought to rest. Well, one thing's for sure. Then Bill needed to come here. 
it's been a difficult road trip. We've had to cover a lot of ground and I've been dragging him from one end of the country to the other. He's been a real star. It's been really wonderful. It's been a real help, very supportive. And now we've achieved basically everything we set out to do. But Bill, like the rest of us, has been experiencing worldly troubles in his life. It's the usual sort of thing, right? We never have enough money. Our relationships never go the way we want them to. We think we're doing the right thing. And then in the end, everything goes wrong and turns sour. We've all been there. But coming here for Bill has been very positive because he's been able to find a few moments of peace and tranquility. An environment with no hassles, where nobody's demanding anything of you and nothing is expected of you. So we sat in the temple for a while and we meditated for a bit. Now he finds it difficult to sit on the floor and cross leg and meditate, so he has to sit on a chair. But many people are like that. Many people are the same. And that's fine. You don't have to sit in lotus position. I mean, it's great if you can. There's said to be great benefits in that. But the main thing is, you've got to be comfortable so that you can sit for long periods of time and just rest with whatever arises. The primary instructions in the Theravadan tradition are merely to follow the breath without becoming distracted or otherwise to scan the bodily sensations and become aware of whatever thoughts may arise. And although there are many different techniques, then in the end, uh, then the results are the same. This brings peace and tranquility, stability and acuity to the mind. And that's where we have to start. This is what this senior monk, this Russian Ajin, I'm sorry, I don't know his name, but he said something that rang true to me, something very important. He said that many people come to meditation and they have these feelings like they should be doing something, that they should be accomplishing something in their practice, and that there is something expected of them and it can make them a little bit edgy and uptight, as if they're not good enough. And he said, the first thing to do is just to be able to sit. And then through watching your breath or watching your mind, then you can come to accept who you are. And then when you've come to accept who you are and where you are, and that is possible to make progress. And that progress will come in a much more easy and relaxed manner. So we have to leave quite early in the morning. I think we're heading to the airport about four. Need to get up just after three. And then I'm making my way back uh, to Canada via Reykjavik. And so I think I'll just leave you with those thoughts. That thought that if you're able to accept just who you are, without judgment and without feeling pressured uh, to improve or to change yourself, then that itself will be a wonderful and powerful first step on the path to liberation that is taught by the Buddha over 2,500 years ago. Until next time, and see you later.